So let's do uh, transition to a couple of other to topics, including not unrelatedly atheism and, and maybe not entirely unrelatedly the New Republic. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, this this part of the conversation may uh, become a yeah. separately posted conversation. So let me just uh, repeat in more condensed form: You're Jeet here, and I'm not, as uh, as Chevy Chase used to say on Saturday Night Live, uh, more or less. Um, so, what do you want? You want to talk about atheism or um, or the yeah. New Republic and or whatever? Uh, let's talk about. Um uh, atheism a little bit because I think it like uh, segues nicely okay. um, into that. I mean, uh, because I mean, I think that there's been in the last you know uh, uh, 15, ten or fifteen years a sort of resurgence of a new atheism, as they call it, and there's a lot of issues about the new atheism that I think are very similar to the debates over uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, because um, uh, the new atheism is a very in-your-face atheism. Right. It's atheism that, you know, like really is abrasive and sort of takes pleasure in trolling, right? Like in sort of needling. Uh, and I think that the blindness of the new atheism um, is exactly that it doesn't consider the sort of disparate impact of like, you know, the, the difference between making fun of you know, Christians in a majority Christian culture and making fun of, you know, religious minorities in, um, uh, so I think that that's, I mean, the new atheism um, has, or seems to have a real blind spot right. uh, uh, on issues of inequality. Uh, and so, I mean, I kind of, have, I'm very divided about this because I do think, uh, like blasphemy, I think atheism has a very valuable role to play in the world. I think in the long run of civilization, atheism has been a civilizing force um, and, and not just for secular people, like I think for religion as well, like the critique of atheism has made religion more honest. Atheism is the, the devil's advocate of religion, if you will. Uh, and you, I mean, it's, uh, so you could just see like the intellectual development of Christianity and Judaism um, uh, has improved thanks to atheist critiques, right? So, but, but I think that, I mean, yeah, the, but the new atheism, and to, to specify, I'm talking about people like Richard Dawkins, uh, Sam Harris, and right. I, I guess the late Christopher Hitchens, right? It, that, that seems like a very, it's, it seems like a very dubious or pernicious offshoot of the larger tradition of free thought. Um, and I think, I mean, I'll ask your thoughts on this. Like, doesn't it seem to be really coming out of like 9-11 and the war on terrorism? And it seems like the sort of I, I, I think offshoot of that. I think there are separate strands. Yeah. For Sam Harris, I think it comes out of 9-11. And for that reason, I think it isn't just that he's indifferent to the fact that trolling may be a more offensive or explosive thing for an ethnic minority in the United States, which would be Muslims, than yeah. for the majority population of Christians. His trolling, it seems disproportionately targeted so, at Muslims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of the opposite of what you're recommending. I mean, his, his book, uh, The End of Faith, the very first anecdote is suppose all you know about a guy is that he's got a suicide bomb strapped on and he gets on a bus. You can guess his religion, right? So from, from the very beginning of that book, yeah. he's he's like uh, kind of kind of uh, criticizing Islam in particular. And I think yeah. if you follow his work, uh, yeah, yeah. it's a lot yeah. about that. Now Richard Dawkins, uh, I, I haven't followed like who he spent. He, he actually does seem to spend a lot of time insulting Muslims, but I think the... <laughs> The original impetus has more to do with fundamentalist Christians. I was yeah, actually yeah. with Richard Dawkins in Oklahoma in the 1990s, before he was a famous atheist. Mm. We had both we were both speaking at the same conference at Cameron College in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I missed uh, this talk that he gave. I got there late to give my talk. Uh, he was still there when I got there. But um, people were saying, man, you should have seen this Richard Dawkins talk. All these fundamentalists got up and gave him shit, and he gave him shit. But I think that's where... Mm -hmm. I've also heard stories about religion's role in his personal life that I won't get into that are conjecturally tied to the new, his new yeah. atheism. But um, I, I think a lot of his thing has to do with, uh, with the, con the perceived constraints imposed by religion on science education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that I think that's where Dawkins was coming from, and I think that Hitchens himself also came out of another sort of like you know the Marxist tradition of um, free thought. But I think with both Dawkins and Hitchens, after nine eleven, they kind of like they reformulated their position, yeah. or they saw nine eleven as an opportunity to make atheism much more popular. 
because it would align with like sort of you know uh, uh, views that are more widely shared, right? Like, right. Uh, and I think that I think that's where the sort of perniciousness comes in because like if you have you know as I I, I don't see the point of having an atheism that is, you know, pro-status quo, you know, pro-imperialist, and which, you know, like, is kind of indifferent to issues of inequality and patriarchy. If you're going to have that, you might as well go to church. Like, at least if you go to church, you'll get good music, right? <laughs> like, uh, and so, so, I mean, and that's what a lot of the new atheism seems to have. I mean, and then, I mean, I mean, aside from the Islamic issue, it seems like very blind on gender. Like, there's a really good article by, um, I think he's, uh, it's appeared on Blogging Heads, uh, uh, Mark uh, Oppenheimer, about the sort of, you know, sexism within the new atheism. Yeah, he has. That's a weird, I'm not sure that's related. I, I don't quite get how that became a part of it, but it did, uh, partly because of, of things, uh, Dawkins did, and, and partly as a result of things that Michael Shermer allegedly did. Yeah. Well, well, uh, here's where I see it as related. Oh, I think, yeah. Dawkins' thing is related, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that the, I think what I, what I see as a relation is that it comes out of this blind spot where they see religion as like the all powerful enemy, and that's the problem. If we just get rid of religion, then we'll, I mean, I, I think that. Sam Harris and Dawkins have almost literally said this. Like, you know, if we just get rid of religion, you know, everything will be fine. But I mean, I don't think that's like actually true. Like, I think that there's all these other issues in the world. Like, if you get rid of religion, we still have climate change, right? right. <laughs> like, if you get rid of religion, we'll still have patriarchy and we'll still have like racism. Uh, right. And so I think that. Oh, yeah. The oh, I think, uh, just to interject, I think the fundamental claim that religion does more harm than good in the, in the world uh, mm. is, is false, certainly contestable. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, th I think, I think, yeah, that that claim, uh, but but that claim gets to the heart of it, and I think that's a real um, problem. And I, I think that it's almost they fetishize religion without seeing that the problems of religion are like social and political, right? Like the, the, you know, if religion does harmful things, it's because it's tied to harmful social and political movements. Uh, and in some ways, it seems like atheist, the new atheists are a real retreat from the sort of, you know, the great tradition of sort of um, uh, uh, social critique that one sees in someone like Marx, where like Marx is interestingly, you know, um, sees religion um, as having a social function. Uh, and, you know, it's the opium of the people, but there's a great passage in Marx where he says, you know, um, religion is the uh, painted flower on the prison wall. And our job should not be to simply, you know, erase that flower and leave the prisoner in the prison. It should be to, you know, like eradicate the wall. <laughs> and I see people like Dawkins and Harris, like they just want to erase the flower, right? And just keep the prison. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, it's a right wing... Yeah, there there is a related, I think, Marxist reason that I think isn't exactly the same. That 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 I think it, it, the new atheism is in some ways a right wing doctrine. Mm. Um, it's it's this. It's it's that um, a premise of the new atheism is that all quote religious violence is inspired by like religious doctrine. Religion mm. is the problem. Yeah. So like you see Israel Palestine, these Palestinian yeah. Muslims doing things and they, and they may say they're doing them in the name of Islam and they say well that's the problem it's religion. Well no, yeah. there's a dispute over land here. And and, yeah. and and that's what's underlying this and in fact it, what is probably the first Israel Palestine related act of terrorism on American soil, the assassination of Robert Kennedy by Sirhan Sirhan mm -hmm. was committed by a Palestinian who was a Christian. Yeah, yeah, and and um, and and he didn't mention religion because at that point it was a purely nationalist thing. As these as these things fester, they often do acquire a kind of religious coding, and more and more in the way of religious justification. But for Richard Dawkins to say as he did, if there were no religion, um, there would be no Israel Palestine conflict, is just so yeah, yeah profoundly wrong and and right wing. Because, because yeah, it's yeah. a justification of the status quo, and and, uh, and and it's an argument that, as you say, you take the people who are under occupation and leave them in prison. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And, and exactly, yeah. Now, Dawkins, and, and it's, it's his unwillingness to see issues as being you know, social and uh, political in nature, and like just and taking religion at, at face value. In some ways, the new atheists 
uh, are the flip uh, side of sort of like religious people in the sense that they think, you know, it's all about God and the Bible. And but but it's not. I mean, anyone who studies the history of religion knows it's like you know it's often tied to like these uh, social uh, forces. So it's it's yeah, it's a very um, uh, so so. I, I mean, I think the new atheism is a kind of uh, uh, ultimately a very pernicious thing. And uh, uh, you know, like well, unfortunately, atheists. I mean, if a if a Catholic does something bad, people can say, well, this is not in my name, you know. Right. Uh, whereas I I think more atheists need to say like you know like Richard Dawkins doesn't speak in my name. Uh, and actually, to, to give another example, which I think is really pertinent, Sam Harris actually said, like, if he had the choice between getting rid of rape and getting rid of religion, he would get rid of religion, which to me seems, well, first of all, it's just like a, such a senseless thing to say, right? Like, because religion and rape aren't like, you know, they're two different categories of things. Uh, and then, but, but even beyond that, like, it's, it's like... A weird, it's just a weird thing to... Yeah. Dawkins, relatedly, to get back to their issues with, with kind of feminism and, yeah. and, and gender issues, he, there was a, a woman at, a, at an atheist conference or something who had said, you know, she, I think she was a speaker, she got in an elevator, it was just her and this guy who had been, yeah. who had, she didn't know him, yeah. and he said something kind of suggestive mm. and like maybe ask her up to his room or something, it was something that made her feel creepy and rightly yeah. so, because she's alone with, in an elevator yeah. with a yeah. guy who's saying uh, kind of weird stuff. And Dawkins belittled her because yes. he said, you don't understand, Muslim women have it worse. And and, and he, he didn't just say that substantively. He just ridiculed this woman. Yeah, whereas yeah, yeah. she had a perfectly legitimate gripe. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say, quickly interject two things. First of all, I don't think I made the, the, the Marxist linkage clear when I was talking about mm -hmm. religion not being the source of conflict. I mean, one of Marx's premises is that, you know, facts on the ground, economic facts, political facts, yeah. drive stuff, and then things like religion are more like what came to be called superstructure, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they reflect the, yeah. the, the arena where the real action is, and that's kind of my view of this. It, it wasn't Dawkins' view when he said that about Israel-Palestine. I think he has kind of come to see the light slowly, and now his emphasis is on uh, when you press him on this, as I did once, his emphasis is on religion's role as an ethnic marker. So in other yeah. words, there wouldn't be conflict. Uh, I mean, maybe, you know, in, 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 in uh, Ireland, maybe if there weren't Protestants and Catholics to begin with, if there was, if there weren't two tribes might not be conflict. Okay, fine. But in Israel, Palestine, the religion doesn't matter. It was Arabs who spoke one language yeah. and Jews who spoke another language. So there was plenty of ethnic marking. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. What he said still doesn't make sense, but he is now closer to enlightenment than Sam Harris on this point, I think. <laughs> okay. Which but I, is I, not I, setting the bar very high. Wrong about, like, Ireland, because I do think that the... I mean, yeah, it, it just seems like in Ireland, as in... I think there's a lot of parallels where you have, like, a sort of settler colonialist population. Oh, there are. And then I think, yeah, I, mean, I don't... But, but, yeah, okay, but I mean, but yeah. I, but I think yeah, it I think, helps the... Con to the extent that there are identifiable tribes, Yeah. it... It makes conflict more likely. Yeah, but that's but I mean, but those could be like anything, you know, in a sense, right? Exactly, like, that's the point. It, it, this is not peculiar religion. Yeah, it, yeah. it could be any. It could be uh, soccer fans yeah. of different teams. Yeah, yeah. If I'm, I'm if I'm like an English colonial settler and I want to take the land, like if we have the same religion, I'll say these are redheads. The redheads have to be like you know, right. uh, taken you know, like kicked off the land. Right. And, not given the so, vote. So people tend to find markers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they feel that they uh, have a grievance. Yeah, yeah. Or or that they want to exploit somebody. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So so and as we see, like you know, in American history, like you know, like black Christians and white Christians, you know, blacks and whites have the same religion in America, right. but you know, they find other ways of work, of distinguishing themselves. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Although religion can sometimes be a basis of uh, of interethnic ethnic yeah, yeah, yeah. amity. Yeah, yeah, no, um, no, no, you know, and 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 to the credit of of twentieth uh, century Christianity, when I was going to Sunday school, you know, we sang, and this was right around the time of the Civil Rights Act, we mm -hmm. sang "Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world," red and yeah. yellow, black and white, right? Mm -hmm. I mean that, and I think that's an example of of religion being progressive. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's true. It's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so no, I, yeah, I don't no, absolutely agree. Yeah, and anyways, I, yeah, so, so I think. Uh, I mean, I think we've 
pretty much on the same page on the on the new atheist. Which uh, and I'm glad to hear that uh, Dawkins is more is heading towards enlightenment. Although I think you would do. What do you think of Harris's work on sort of Buddhism? Like I think that would that have any interest to you at all? Or yeah, I I I I, uh, I listened to the book. Technically, didn't read it. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm working on a book on this, and yeah. So uh, I'm interested in that. And it turned out, uh, much to my relief, not to be at all the book I'm writing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I just think the, the, there's, there's a line in there. He's embracing, he's saying that, you know, it's, it's when, you know, in meditation, you, he's something about this feeling of boundless love for all people or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if you really think that's an ideal you should live by, I would do a little less of insulting billions of people yeah. as a way to make a living. Yeah, okay? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, no, no, I think that's. Uh, that's you know, uh, it's, I mean, give me a break. It, you know, he 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 clearly takes delight yes. in insulting people. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he's a troll. He's, yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, he's he's like sort of had these thought experiments about like dropping a bomb on Mecca. Like you know, like you don't do that if you're full of like bondless love for humanity. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you that's know, a, he's, a, he's a you know he's an interesting guy. I I I will say I think um, his meditative experiences are essentially authentic. I think he's a very serious meditator yeah. who's who's done a lot of. Mm -hmm. Who knows no know, knows that stuff? Yeah, I just I just don't think he could possibly be aware of the gap between uh, what what he preaches and what he practices here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, uh, we've had uh, Sam and I have had issues. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what? So you want us to talk about uh, New Republic? Yeah, yeah, I mean, as I said, you're going to be contributing to the New Republic. Congratulations and uh, yes. I know Gabe Snyder, the editor of the New Republic, is excited about that, as he told me. Yes, yes, yes. And then Gabe has uh, been announcing um, uh, hirings uh, and other and other contributors. And I think uh, one interesting thing is uh, one of the new senior editors is going to be Jamel Smith, who is the first African-American uh, senior staffer in the history of the New Republic in 100 years of publication. Hmm. Uh, and he's, and, and, and prior to Jamel, I believe, I, I have to, I don't know if I can completely verify this, but as I, my understanding is that they've only ever had two black staffers in their entire history of the magazine. Um, one was Justin Driver, in, uh, who was an assistant literary editor in, about, um, in the early 21st century. Um, and the other one whose name I'm going to mangle, do you know Dale, um, oh, Anyways, she's a very uh, uh, um, good reporter, and she she worked as a reporter. I don't think I do know her. Yeah, yeah, two thousand and eight. Yeah, but there, but there's been yeah. So, so I think one of the things I'm, I guess I can say this I, when I'm working on a piece about the history of the New Republic and race, and um, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting history, and it's sort of like a, a checkered history because they, which has both good and bad things in it, right? Like. Uh, I mean, they, they published like uh, W. E. B. Du Bois uh, in 1915, and they right. they published a, a lot of very um, you know, Harlem Renaissance writers in the 1920s. Uh, but along with a lot of stuff um, that's more problematic, and I think what I guess one interesting thing that that might connect with the history of the magazine is that there's it's always been a sort of liberal magazine, but a magazine coming from the liberal elite, like it's had. Um, its early foundings were like you know Walter well, Lippmann. Walter Lippmann was was something of an elitist. Yes, 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 and Herbert Crowley as well. I mean, he kind of at least in the Promise of American Life talked about you know wanting a sort of like a creative elite in a, in America, and they and so there is a kind of disjunction, but but in the magazine. Um, uh, always between this sort of ideal of a kind of, you know, like Harvard elite that would, technocratic, that would figure out the solutions to problems, and the actual, you know, living nature of liberalism in America, which has had, a, you know, grassroots element. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think on race, but also on other issues, the magazine's always reflected that tension. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's one of the things I'm wrestling with. Yeah. Well, that's good. So you're going to keep uh, the rest of it under wraps, the... Uh... <laughs> I mean, you've been tweeting, you've been tweeting, uh, probably some of it could be derived from your tweets, but no need to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, 
Uh, maybe I could ask you since you were there. Like one thing I was kind of, it might have to do with the trajectory of Martin Perrette's, but like I think even in the 70s and 80s, the magazine was still kind of divided and there was a lot of good stuff on race in the 80s of dealing with poverty and stuff like that. But around 1990, there's a real turn hmm. where like the magazine just becomes yeah. uh like just takes what I think is a, a standard conservative line of like, you know, the problem is black culture. It's a pathological culture, you know, which has all these like issues. And, uh, yeah. and so, so, so I think in the nineties, I think the nineties were the worst decade. Uh, yeah, well that, and, so in the nineties, so late eighties, I, I got there in 88, Mike Kinsley is editor. Yeah. It's around, uh, it's around 1990 that he no longer is. I think yeah, he edited yeah, yeah. Uh, near the yeah. end of 89 for a while. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, 91, Andrew Sullivan takes over. and uh, yeah. But I'm not sure if the change is just like, it's like going from, you know, Kinsley, Hertzberg to Sullivan. Is, is yeah. that just the issue? Or was there like an actual turn in um, in, per, in the thinking of Peretz and other people at the magazine? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think Marty would have expressed the view probably that you just uh, described. Mm -hmm. prevailing in the 90s i think that probably well to some extent he he would have cited what he would have called cultural pathology in the 80s yeah you know i i so so it could just be a question of of of, of an editor who's more giving marty more in the way of free yeah. reign and and assigning more of the pieces marty wants assigned i don't know uh i will say in defense of marty um you know i, I remember um yeah, it's true. There, I don't. There were no black people on the editorial side when I was there. Um, uh, the there was uh, there was a black student of Marty's at Harvard, mm. uh, who um, Marty brought on board on the business side, mm -hmm. and and really encouraged him and tried to help him and very sincerely did. And I and I remember he. I think Marty told me that he had had uh, he had a number of blacks in this class at Harvard, apparently, and he had a thing at his home and invited all the students. And he and I, and I gathered pretty much all the white students showed up, but among the blacks, only one did, and it was this guy. Yeah. And um, and maybe that shouldn't be the criterion for, for trying to help this guy as opposed to the other black students. I don't know, but I think yeah. Marty was sincere. Oh, in, in wanting to help this guy, he really, he yeah, really yeah, yeah. was. Well, I mean, I think yeah, I don't want to like demonize the, like Marty Peretz because I think that there's an interesting thing there where I mean he actually was pretty involved with the civil rights movement in the sixties, oh, totally, and seventies. And I think I think it's more, um, I mean, whatever went wrong with him, it's it's a case of a kind of like a broken heart. Like I think the the, the turn of like you know black radicals against yeah. Israel was a huge kind of wound to him. Uh, the whole issue of you know like Jews and blacks was uh, 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 uh it became a problem so i think i see him as a kind of like a disappointed paternalist you yeah know? and more specifically if you read rick hertzberg's piece in the 100th anniversary issue yeah. there's a brief allusion to an incident where uh you know marty uh he was financing uh some leftist stuff in the yeah. like late 60s early 70s or whenever yeah. and there was some big event mm -hmm. that i think as rick described it uh, in the piece was kind of taken over by black nationalists or something mm -hmm. like that yeah and it had been um financed largely by marty yes and i had previously heard allusions to that as speculatively mm -hmm. as something that that fed into mm -hmm. his psychology but but you know look i uh my experience with him was that you know certainly in this one case he really he really wanted to help Mm -hmm. uh, this black guy, you know, it's, it's not like I heard Marty, you know, sitting in his office spewing racial epithets or anything. <laughs> yeah. He had what is a conservative diagnosis of the problem. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. No, I think so. Uh, yeah, and, and and that's that is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think that there's like a couple of, um, I mean, there's a couple of factors at work here. Uh, one of which is like, you know, like there's an ideal New Republic editor and it usually, you know, like it's a young guy from Harvard, right? And uh, the, so so that already kind of like limits, you know, your number of candidates. Yeah. Uh, and, but I mean, beyond that, like the magazine has a kind of culture where like a lot of the people who like did well in the magazine kind of like grew up reading the magazine. Yeah. Like, you know, um, 
uh, Foyer, Franklin Foyer, like talks about in the introduction to his new book, talks about you know, his father read the New Republic right. and was around the house, and you know, like you know, you talk about you talk to people who are reading the New Republic when they're fourteen or fifteen or whatever, right? Right. And that's not, you know, like, and you're not going to get a lot of black people who that falls into, and then, and then these things become self perpetuating, where when the magazine gets a reputation for um, uh, being a conservative magazine on on race. Then, like in the 1990s, you're not going to get someone like Ta Nisi Coates, you know, like who's at Howard, Howard, you know, sending in his resume. I want to be an intern at the New Republic, right? right. And so, 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 like there are these feedback effects that be- become self-reinforcing. Uh, I mean, that you, know, Lyra, you think about Harvard reminds me when when I took over as acting editor when Mike Kinsley went to uh, to the Economist for a seven month sabbatical. Uh, one of the tabloids, the media reporter, at one of the tabloids, either the Daily News or the Post in New York. Um, uh, did a little piece on it and how uh, Mike was leaving and the, and the theme was that he was so productive that they were hiring two people to do the job he had done because they because they got Rick Hersberg to write TRB at that point which yeah. he done. they got media at the magazine and the guy asked me so wait a he said where'd you go to college I said I graduated from Princeton he said wait a second you didn't go to Harvard <laughs> and I said I, and I said yeah I guess they have an affirmative action program here <laughs> and and the guy printed that and, uh-huh. and and I remember Mike not being that happy about it. And I'd only been at the magazine a few months when all this happened. And I guess I didn't appreciate that maybe it was already a critique of the magazine kind of in play that oh, that there wasn't that enough actual affirmative action there. But um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the... Uh... I mean, I, I was joking with a friend like that. I think a lot of people are upset at Gabriel Snyder because he went to Yale yeah. <laughs> rather than uh, Harvard. So that's uh, he's, he's, he's an outsider. Yeah, uh, um, well, it's not yeah. as bad as Princeton, but it's it's bad. It's bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I, yeah, I think that that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to like give away my story, but I, I do think that there's that aspect of a kind of like a disappointed paternalism uh, and a kind of like souring mood. Um, that comes from a souring idealist. Like I do see Peretz as kind of like you know, like you know, having you know some noble intent <laughs> at the start, whatever he ended up becoming. Um, and I think oh, I, yeah. I think oh, it's we, general... we all do. I mean, I, I just I think people in general do. I mean, everybody, yeah. everybody, pretty much everyone. T- those guys who murdered the people in Paris think they're doing. <laughs> they literally think they're doing God's work. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so uh, to, to, to be explicit, I, I'm not. I would. I personally would not compare Marty Peretz to the, the guys that killed twelve. <laughs> I, I wasn't trying to. I wasn't trying but, to attribute that view to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But uh, 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 but um, and but I think on, on a more general issue, I think it's an issue with liberalism in general. That like you know one of the. Uh, uh, liberalism has always had these two sides. It's had the side of, you know, like these Harvard intellectuals or, you know, yeah, I, Ivy League intellectuals that have a progressive vision and it's had a more popular side. And these two things, uh, I mean, they, at the best occasions, they can feed into each other productively as in the you know, early civil rights movement where, you know, the sort of, you know, the mobilization at Selma push the, you know, Kennedy and um, uh, Johnson administration, you know, forward. But but but, but then the, the, there can be like a breakdown. And then, yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that happened in the magazine. Yeah, um, I, I think you're probably right. So uh, a magazine like what, in terms of reflecting the, the kind of uh, grassroots of the populist or maybe blue collar part of liberalism, what would you say, Mother Jones more in a, to some extent, the nation, but I don't... Yeah. I, yeah, I do, yeah, the nation isn't quite populist, I would say, but no. I mean, yeah, 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 but so, so something like Mother Jones, or even even just, I mean, the the New Republic in its finer moments. Like I think, in the late thirties, forties, and fifties, on race at least, the magazine was actually quite good. And the sixty going into the sixties, because I think that it um, was good. It, uh, often had like black writers and was often like on the ground working with like the NAACP or with with. Whereas like I think. Under Peretz, under the worst moments, you kind of had a kind of like a theoretical, intellectual approach from people who like didn't have any lived experience. And mm-hmm. I mean, this is a point that Coates sort of made. Like, you know, like they did that um, uh, issue where they had a symposium. Like, suppose a black man walks into a jewelry store. You know, do you let him in or do you not let him in? And you know, like Coates's point is like, well, you know, for the writers of the magazine, that's a theoretical issue, right? Like, this is like, you know, you let's let's have a a uh, bull session, like, you know, do you let in the black man? Whereas, like, if you, you know, if you're if you're black, that's not a theoretical issue, right? You know, whether 
you're going to be let into a jewelry store is yeah. like... Yeah, I mean, at the same time, I would say this is something we know happens with taxi cab drivers and so yeah, yeah. on. They would say, look, I'm just playing the odds. Mm -hmm. You know, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they would say, look, uh, more likely... Uh, and, and the more sophisticated of them might might pay attention to other cues like dress and so on. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and, and they might say that. They might say, look, a well-dressed black guy, fine. Mm -hmm. Guy with saggy jeans, no, whatever. Yeah. Um, and and they would say, I'm just playing the odds and try to minimize yeah. the chances I get robbed or whatever. There are, uh, you know, for whatever reason, correlations between ethnicity yeah. and crime. This would be what they say. So, yeah. so it's a, it's a question worth exploring. And I, I, what I would say is the cab driver's perspective mm. is worth exploring because oh, yeah, it's no, a no, real no, no, phenomenon yeah, yeah. in the real yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think in the, in the case I'm thinking about, I mean, I think they had a variety of points of view. They had that cop. They had someone who ran a jewelry store, and and then I think the black perspective was like Walter Williams, who's like a very like. <laughs> Right wing, like black economist who like occasionally fills in for like Rush Limbaugh, and yeah. so I I think that that I mean I think that that's like a kind of and because an issue where like the the black voices that they did have in the magazine were people like Shelby Steele, uh, you know sometimes you, yeah exactly exactly who are like you know who have valuable things to say like I wouldn't like you know not publish them but I mean like there's a vast spectrum of like black voices that weren't there, right? And then the black voices that were there were atypical of the black community. Yeah. They were the black voices that were like, you know, the closest to Marty Peretz. Yeah. Now when you add when you add what you're saying to the kind of uh uh crypto neocon, fairly consistent kind of I mean, I don't want to put yeah. it too yeah. you know, this is like, you know, not not as neocon as commentary, but on foreign policy yeah, yeah. You know, certainly in that fine line between liberal hawk and liberal interventionist and neocon, they were they were certainly in that space. Yeah. When you add it all up, it's amazing that for as long <laughs> they got away as long as they did <laughs> with the even the liberal New Republic thing, right? Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. it like kept surprising people when they wanted to invade countries, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, because the magazine, I mean, it did, I think under Kinsey and Hertzberg, he allowed them a fair bit of leeway, and it was like two magazines in one, like, right. and, and I, I, did you read Scott McConnell's piece in The American Conservative? Uh, I quickly read it about, yeah, about yeah. the foreign policy mainly, right? Yeah, about the foreign policy, but he, he kind of makes an interesting um, uh, point about, like, how uh, Peretz himself, had a was the one that put in all those articles, and he there's a back channel, right? Like right. if you're a writer for commentary, or you know if you're at the American Enterprise Institute or whatever, and you had an article that you thought was really good and wanted to like push it at a liberal audience, you would send it to Peretz, and apparently like he had a way of getting like mail that Hertzberg and Kinsley wouldn't know about. Yeah, there was something. <laughs> then, there was some joke about delivering it in a brown paper bag. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The mail yeah. room or something. But oh yeah, sure, yeah. But, oh sure. But, but, the, the, oh, the neocons were all coming through Marty. Yeah. And he was inflicting them on 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 yeah. either Mike Kinsley or or Rick or during my brief tenure, me. Yeah, um, I, actually, I, I think the analogy I use, which I think might be helpful for people, is with Encounter magazine in the. 50s, which we now know was funded by the CIA, right? And if you look at Encounter, though, they published a lot of like, you know, like um, social democratic, you know, progressive things, a lot, a lot of poetry by people like Auden. And then, you know, but they would always have like, you know, an article like, you know, why Sartre is wrong, what's wrong with Euro communism or right. whatever. And so it was like, uh, it was a front magazine, right? Like um, it, there was like uh, the liberal stuff to attract the British intellectuals, uh, you know, who want to read Philip Larkin's latest poem, and then there was the uh, the um, American foreign policy perspective that the CIA wanted to encourage. And so, I mean, in some ways, the New Republic was like a front magazine, except privately funded and not by the CIA. This is the the most cynical reading. I mean, I think the, <laughs> the I think the flaw in it is that the way it actually worked there. Mm. was like Marty would have been in some ways conservative almost across the board yeah. if there hadn't been this resistance effort being yeah. mounted by the editor. So it's not like yeah. Marty was thinking, okay, let's publish this really left-wing piece on domestic yeah. economics or something. You mm -hmm. know, he wasn't, I don't, I don't think he was encouraging much of that, you know, in order to maintain the front that were liberal. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I think it just kind of happened. I, I, yeah, I think yeah. he. Just yeah, no, went, I think that's a yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I you know. I, I, I take the point, and I think in some ways, what happened with the magazine was like under Kinsley and Hertzberg, you had an interesting tension because you had a tension between their you know genuine liberalism, especially with Hertzberg, yeah, and with like you know Peretz's like you know increasingly neocon perspective and so that the magazine had a tension it was an interesting read once sullivan gets in place like and then michael kelly later you had editors who didn't have any resistance who like right. completely went along with like whatever Perez wanted and agreed with him and that's when you get the bell curve that's when you get stephen glass that's when you get like you know all these problems so yeah. i think does that make sense i think that's fair to say yes yeah. uh that um i mean i i don't know you know uh Andrew did a lot of good stuff, but I, I think oh, yeah. the basic, uh, you know, Michael Kelly, uh, I would yeah, say yeah. maybe not so much, but but in either, but but with both of them, you're right. They were more conservative by by intellect and temperament, and 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 they just mounted less resistance. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, no, I mean, I shouldn't say I mean, Sullivan uh, did stuff I would agree with him. He he hired John Judas apparently, like which is like uh, John John yeah. Judas. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, Mike had brought him in, yeah. well, I don't know who brought him into the magazine, but he yeah. was, he wrote for the magazine sometimes when Mike was there. I think uh, Andrew hired him as a staff. A yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very positive thing. I mean. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, oh, I mean. Andrew I was, was fine with publishing a, a great diversity of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that that. Uh, I mean, I think with Sullivan, maybe the problem was not even the conservatism, but he had this idea, which is a very British idea, that, you know, you want things that are provocative and you don't they don't necessarily have to be true. And I think that, like, if you're actually publishing a magazine, like, you kind of have to be able to stand by what you publish, right? So if you're going to... So, I mean, that's how he defends, like, publishing No Exit, the healthcare piece uh, by... Yeah, is it Betsy McCaus? Betsy McCaus. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then the bell curve, like that's kind of like Sullivan's default defense. Like, well, these are provocations. They they got people talking. But I mean, I think if you publish, if you're, you know, like I think a, a reader can reasonably say, like, if you're publishing this piece, I like I want to know that you kind of like are standing behind this, you know, and are not like. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, No Exit was certainly influential. I mean, it played a real role in sinking the Clinton healthcare yeah. initiative. Um, the uh, and it's also true separately that. British journalism, I don't know about Andrew, but British journalism is a is more casual about truth. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. It absolutely is. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. not to say that American journalism doesn't suffer from flaws that are equally grave in terms of impact, but, I mean, as Mike pointed out, you can fetishize literal truth while being fundamentally dishonest. Sure, um, sure, yeah. But, I mean, I think... You certainly see stuff. I mean, I've noticed like just fact checking stuff. Like I would never rely on a British newspaper to fact check anything. Like I would, you know, and and, and you literally like I've seen stories where they like just made things up out of whole cloth. You know, yeah. like uh, so. Yeah, I think it's. I think he, I don't know if that's like I. Th I think with Andrew, it's not so much the British journalist culture because he didn't come out of the Daily Telegraph or anything like that. I think it's more the uh, the um, uh, Oxbridge debating culture. You know, like. Like the history, you ever see the movie History Boys? It sort of. I, I saw the play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, but it's a culture where you're trained to like argue a point. Well, you saw this with Chris Hitchens. You saw this with Chris Hitchens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, mean, yeah. he. he well, we shouldn't indulge my biases too much, but he made some of the just stupidest arguments. Yeah, yeah. I've ever heard, but they were, but they impressed people. Yeah, yeah. He yeah, did yeah. them with tremendous finesse, and he was very good at appealing to people's emotions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And then you argue to win rather than, you know, like trying to get at the truth, and, uh, and yeah, it's, 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 I mean, like everything, it has some positive sides, but it's, it's also very, it has a real pernicious side to it, too. Yeah. And, uh, I hadn't yeah. thought of that. Huh? I hadn't <laughs> thought of that. I said, okay, so we've covered Atheism New Republic in, in what I think now will be a, seg a second yeah. kind of second okay, good. Yeah. blogging heads. Anything else before we... Uh, uh, no, I think that's it. I mean, we've been talking for a while. so We I have think been, all told. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So listen, thank you. Good luck yeah. with your, in, in general, with your uh, association with the New Republic. Um, thank you, I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to the peace on race. And mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. <clears throat> I, I am too. I think I think that the uh, Gabriels made a lot of like, you know, smart hires and, mm -hmm. and smart uh, commissioning positions. And I think, and sometimes it might be, you know, like I don't want to offend anybody who used to work at the New Republic, but I think like in some ways the magazine needed a shake-up. Like it needed in some ways to be reinvented. So I think this, this is a good moment. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's starting to show up on the web, the new New Republic, but I think it's still in a pretty inchoate state. And, oh, yeah, uh, no, he's still working on stuff. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing this, this first edition uh, yeah. of, of the physical uh, mm. magazine under the new regime where, where, where presumably we will see something from you. So, that's, uh, that's right. So, yeah. uh, so, 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 so thanks a lot. And, uh, thank you. Uh, let's do this again before long. Yes, we'll do, we'll do it soon, yeah. Okay. okay.